Good morning and welcome to all of you that are watching by way of Rumble Live. God bless you. We're glad to have you with us this morning. And uh, we're in our Sunday school class called the Auditorium Bible Class. That's where we study the Word of God. And we've been going through a series on uh, uh, running the race that God has set before us. And we went through that and uh, we learned that running that race, sometimes there's going to be trials along the way, obstacles, and, and how we deal with those trials in the race. Then we learned, uh, two weeks ago, we learned that uh, uh, along the way in the race, if you've been to any races of any kind, there's a lot of noise. And you'll find that in your race that you're running is a lot of noise. And we learned through David in Psalm chapter 40 on how to rise above the noise. You're not going to get rid of the noise. The noise is there. I mean, when you go to a game or a racetrack or anything, the noise is there until it's all over and the crowd leaves and everybody's gone and the... And the groundskeeper's out there by himself picking up all the graffiti, vacuuming and everything. That's the only noise you hear is the vacuum cleaner. Okay? And so it all dies down. It's interesting how uh, there's 100,000 people in a stadium and then the listening decibel's 120, 130. And when the game's all over and everybody's gone, you can walk in the stadium and there's dead silence. And you go, oh my goodness, I, I can't believe it. Look how, how quiet it is. You know, you can hear a cup, the wind blow a cup way over on the other side of the stadium from the top row down. You can hear the cup. So we learned how to come over to override, to rise above the noise. And then last week we, we started a, a little mini series here, but it's not another series. It's just going along with the race that is set before us because each one of us has a race. Now there's the general race that we all run. The general race of life, we're all involved in that race and running it, right? But then God has for each and every one of us a particular race for our lives. Each one of us has a different race to run that God has set, the Bible says, in Hebrews, has set before us. So we have a race that sets before us, and, uh, and we have a new race this year in 2024. Can you believe we're already a month and a half into it? My, my, how time flies. I mean, we're already a month and a half with Valentine's Day coming up Wednesday. We're already in the middle of February. Uh, but we have an interesting race this year to run in 2024. If you're listening, paying attention to anything going on and listening to, I don't care, even the liberal news if you want to listen to it, but the conservative news and commentators and so forth and Bible scholars and, and even, uh, even the, the, the liberal crowd is talking and mentioning stuff that it's amazing to listen to them uh, to say what's going on. And it, it's going to be an interesting year. This year is going to be a lot of challenges set before us in our race. And uh, there's going to say things coming down uh, the pike that uh, probably are going to be uncomfortable, that we're not going to like. Uh, so we're going to need some courage to run the race. You're going to need some courage. And so I guarantee you, especially in the area of your faith. You know, it was interesting. I was thinking about that this morning on the way here, driving here. And uh, I was listening to my favorite preacher on the radio. It was really nice. I mean, he was preaching about that blaspheming God's name. And I was encouraging him on the radio. Amen, brother. Amen, preacher. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a West Berry Baptist Church Victory Gospel Hour. <laughs> and so, uh, so I'm blaspheming God's name and they're coming in good and clear. I'm going, amen, Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. And uh, I was thinking about the, the, this race that we're running. And we all claim we have faith. Amen. If we're saved. And we all claim we live by faith. But isn't it interesting you find that when every time something happens, faith kind of goes to the side? Anytime we face a trial, a circumstance, a situation, immediately our brain starts thinking, well, how am I going to figure this out? How are we going to get through this? How are we going to work this out? And we just go on and on with that scenario. And faith kind of gets put on the back burner when God wants us to live and walk by faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. And, and you're going to have to have courage. And like when we got into our lesson here, we started last week, we went to Joshua. I mean, it, poor Joshua. Can you imagine being in Joshua's shoes? Here you are, a, uh, you might say a general, uh, you're, you're a combat infantry general of the army of Israel. And this is what you've been doing, and you've been a servant to Moses. Now all of a sudden God comes along in Joshua chapter 1 and says, oh, hey Joshua, by the way, my Moses, my servant Moses is dead, now you're taking charge. Uh, y y okay, yeah, thanks. Do I have a choice in this? Well, in his case, no. You see... And, uh, uh, and he says, and by the way, Joshua, in chapter 1, four times in that, first cha in that one chapter, God told him, you're going to have to be of good courage, you're going to have to have courage, and it was all dealing with faith. Four times he mentioned that, that you're going to have to be a strong and of good courage in your faith. 
that Joshua was going to have to take and need. And, uh, you know, sometimes the race God has set before us, you know, sometimes maybe, you know, you and I don't agree with it. Or, well, I don't kind of like that. You know what I mean, God? You think maybe we could uh, sit down and have a negotiation on this and uh, talk about this? And maybe sometimes God does let us talk about something, but, you know, it's just like whatever you do in our service for the Lord. Sometimes, you know, God calls you and I to a specific service, and he calls us to give us a race in our race, to run our race, and here's the race I want you to run for me. And sometimes, you know, we don't really have a choice in the matter. Uh, Our choice is to be obedient or not obedient. Uh, You know, God, uh, I had a race I was running, and God says, and I have a race for you. And your race is going to be to preach the gospel. And I said, well, I, don't, I, I don't know about this. And I said, do I have a choice in this? He said, no. This is my choice for you. And I choose this for you. And, you know, I got to thinking about that even this morning. And I said, you know, God wants nothing but the best for us. Amen. And he knows what's best for us. And, you know, as I think about it through the years, I'm so glad that God called me and made this my choice and that I followed his lead in obedience to it. Wasn't really what I wanted. My youth director threatened me that God was gonna kill me if I didn't get in the ministry. That scared the daylights out of me. And I fought that for a couple of years and finally surrendered to that call. And uh, you know, it's just, it is. And so Joshua faced that and, and we, we looked at that. So, so let's, uh, if you got last week's lesson, it's called Courageous Part One. And uh, we're looking at Joshua's 1 through 8, and we got through that. And let's real quickly review, and then we'll have prayer, and let's get into it. Father, thank you for today now. We bless you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you for all your goodness to us and your blessings now. We ask that you would bless your time and your word. We thank you for sanctifying it, anointing it. We ask for you to anoint your servant in this hour, that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and our guide, that we may learn something and apply it to our lives, that as we run our race, that you have chosen for us and have set before us. Lord, in each one of us, we're in the general race, but we also have each one has a specific race that you have chosen and set before us to run. And I pray you'd give us the faith and the courage to do it. Now in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You're following along with us last week. The first thing we learned in our race, if we're going to have courage, like with Joshua, you're going to have to do what? You're going to have to trust God's promises. Okay, we're, we're on page uh, two there in Courageous Part One, and we're looking at the middle of the outline there from last week. You're going to have to learn to trust God's promises. Amen, church? Amen. Now, if God's made a promise, will God keep it? Of course. of course. Is God a covenant promise keeping God? Yes. And whatever, and just like when God called me, I, you know, Lord, I, I, I don't know how to do these things, and that's all right. With the calling comes the enablement. Whatever God, the race that God has called you to, you and I, we may think, well, you know, Lord, I can't do this, and I don't have the skills to do this, David. I don't have the ability to do this or the talent. No, if God has put that race before you and called you, he will enable you and give you the ability to do it, and the Holy Spirit will give you the spiritual gifts to do it. So you've got to trust God and believe God in that. You know, one of the things when you go to, I don't care if you go to Bible college or Bible university or university uh, Bible college or seminary, whatever. You know, they, they, they have classes called the hermeneutics and they have a homiletics. Homiletics is where they teach you to preach, how to put outlines and do all this kind of stuff in homiletics. But, you know, you can go through all that. It still, it doesn't teach you how to get in front of people and speak. You know, God has to gift you to that. He, it's an ability that God enables you to gift you. First time I had to speak to the youth group, man, I was sick before I got there. I was throwing up. Uh, my, my knees were shaking. I was nervous as I'll get out. And, I mean, I just, oh, my goodness. But when you let go, let God have his way, you'd be surprised what God does. And, and of course, uh, you know, if I was to go speak somewhere else this morning in some other church, I'd be as nervous as I'll get out. I mean, I'd be shaking, my stomach would be turning and growling, and, you know, you're visiting the little boy's room three or four times before you even get there, and the whole nine yards, you know why? Because they're not my people. They're not my sheep. And, and, and you get real nervous until you get started, and, and then God gets a hold of you, and the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, and, and things begin to go well. And so you've got to trust God's promises this morning. Okay? 
Joshua had to, even though God made all this to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and now to Moses and all this stuff, God promised Israel a land and he told Israel, Joshua, listen, I've promised you a land, now you're going to go take it. And well, I could just see Joshua saying, well, well God, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a combat veteran a general. I lead a combat unit of, of, of men in the battle in, in Israel. And now you want me to lead these two and a half million stiff-necked rebellious Jews? You want me to be their spiritual leader? And I can just think God says, oh, don't worry. As soon as you cross Jordan, you're going to face your first battle. And you're going to have seven more series after that and ten total. So don't worry, you're still going to fight. <laughs> you're, still going to go, you're still going to lead men into battle, so don't worry about it. But in the meantime, I have promised these people a land. I'm going to give it to them, and you must claim it. You've got to claim it. If God's given you something, you need to claim it. All right? So we didn't do that. Then we looked, and we understand that, God, uh, that a land was given to them. A claim must be made. Then we looked at God had a promise, and then God has a promise to us, doesn't he? What has God promised you and I? Power. Hey, you know what, church? I'd rather have power than a land. Amen. Land's nice to have and a piece of property. You know, that's wonderful. But, I mean, and if you have that, praise the Lord. Amen. Because he gives people some land. Some people, we, we, we have a quarter of an acre. And praise God, because I can't even keep that up. So instead, he gave me 14 acres out here. Thank you. Uh-huh. And so he gives us power. Man, you, in, in the race that you're running, you're going to need power. In, in your faith in, in the days and the months ahead, you're going to need power to run your brakes. And then not only does God provide you an hour of power, but he provides us provision. God's going to give us everything we need. He's going to give you the ability to do it, the enablement. He's going to give you the spiritual gifts to carry it out. You have to just trust God and believe God for it and move and walk and live by faith. Man, get out of the boat and walk on water. Amen. Amen. I mean, here were 12 guys. Well, Judas, I don't think, was with them at this time. And maybe he may have been. Yeah, he was. Cause they, and, and so here they are in the boat. Big storm comes up. And they're scared to death for their lives. These are professional fishermen, most of them, seven of them. And boy, I mean, and then all of a sudden here comes a, so to them, first of all, is that a spirit? Is that a ghost? Is that a spook walking on the water? No, it's Jesus. And he gets a little closer, and why was Peter the only one out of the other 11? Lord, if that's you, bid me to come on the water. That was faith. I mean, think about that for just a minute. As a human being, Peter, and even those guys were professional fishermen, he'd never walked on water before. And now all of a sudden, he thinks like, well, hey, there's nothing to this, man. If Jesus can walk on water, so can I. Right? So, hey, Lord, if that's you, let me bend me to come on. Come on, Peter. Just come on. And Peter had to get out of the boat. Now, I'm sure there was a little bit of hesitation there going on, and that foot's going down and just touching the top of that water, and he's waiting to see when I put full weight on it, if it's going to stay there or I've got to bloop, bloop, bloop. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, he, he noticed that was, hey, this ain't so bad after all. Next, foot, next one comes out. Hey, I can dig this, guys. I can just see him turn around looking at him and say, ha, ha, see, you all could have got in on this, but you didn't, ha, ha, ha. You know, I mean, you know, why not have a little fun with it, right? And he went a little ways. Everything looked good. So Peter was running his race. But then all of a sudden, a trial came. Some strong wind got to blowing. The waves got to raging. The circumstances didn't look so good. And he took his eyes off of Jesus and he began to sink. You gotta trust the Lord. God will give you power, his provisions. God will supply everything we need and everything you need to run your race. Amen. You may say, I can't run this race. Yes, you can. God has promised you that he will give you power to run the race. He'll give you endurance to run the race. And he'll give you provision in the race. All right, you need to understand that. All right, so the second thing we need to look at this morning is we need to trust God's presence. His presence. How about his promises, amen? His presence. Trust God's presence. Okay, uh, look at me and look with us in verse 5 of our text there. Everybody in verse 5 in our text? Everybody see our, 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 our text verse there? What's verse 5 tell us? 
There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Wow, what a promise, huh? What a promise. Notice, well, look what he told Joshua there in your, now church in your race, the same thing. You need to trust God's presence. You're in the race, you're running. It's a trial, it's a heavy one. There's a circumstance, it's a situation, and it doesn't look good. You need to trust God's presence, he's with you. You notice when Peter got out of the boat, he wasn't the only one on the water. Hello? Yeah. Who else was on the water? Jesus. Okay. His presence was there on the water with him. How about remember the three Hebrew children that decided to take a, a, a trip to the fiery furnace? Heated up seven times. Well, wait a minute. King says, hey, wait a minute, guys. He brought all the Texas instrument computers in there, calculators, you know, and, and, it, and it, his accountants and everything. And did we not throw three men in the fire? Oh, absolutely, King, absolutely. They weren't going to say it different. You know, oh, yes, yes, absolutely. Dead. Why is it that I see four? He was able to see that. And he says the fourth looks like the, that of the Son of Man. Whose title was that? Jesus gave himself that title as the Son of Man. Whoa. Why are there all of a sudden there's four in the midst of a fiery furnace trial? Those boys had a race to run. And the race that God had set before them there in Babylon. And now they decided they were going to stick to God. They were going to trust God's promises. That God would deliver them one way or the other. If we go in the furnace, that's fine. We're not going to bend. We're not going to bow. You might as well forget it. So let's get this thing over with and throw us in there. But our God will deliver us one way or another. So isn't that interesting to think about that for a minute? You want to talk about a, a, a life after death and a resurrection right there. Those boys realized right there and spoke it into existence. It don't matter. God will deliver us one way or the other. Even if we roast in this fiery furnace, God is going to deliver us. Well, where in the world would He deliver them to? Glory. Paradise. And there was. Who was in there? The presence of the Lord. In their race that they were running. And this race not turning out too well. This is not kind of like we planned it, right guys? Uh, no, we weren't kind of counting on this. But nevertheless, we're going to trust God. We're going to trust His promises. We're going, to, we're going to trust God's power. And we're going to trust His presence. And when they got in the fire, there was the fourth person. The Lord was there with them in the fiery trial. And the only thing that the fire hurt was burned off the ropes off their hands. We're talking about a furnace that was heated up seven times hotter. Matter of fact, the scripture tells us when the captains of the Nebuchadnezzar's uh, ca captains of his men threw them in, they were consumed immediately. <laughs> Vaporized. See, this was a big furnace and it had an open top to it so you could look down in it. And he threw them down in there and it roasted those men right there on the spot. And the Lord was sitting over there at the table having tea. You know, it was afternoon time British tea. Hey, fellas, come on over. Can you imagine when they heard a voice in the fire? And they realized, can you imagine when they first felt the flames? Uh, can you imagine that? Because that, they're thinking, this is it, guys. We're done. We're finished. We're going to be vaporized. And then all of a sudden, whoa. You okay? Yeah. You okay? Yeah. You hurt? No. You feel it? No. Hey, Shackles, our ropes are gone. This is amazing, man. God truly has delivered us. Hey, boys, what you talking about? Huh? Did you all hear that voice? Come on over and let's have some tea. Whatever they drink. Pomegranate juice, whatever. Papaya juice, I don't know. Come on over, have a little, let's have some fellowship. You notice what I really loved about that thing? While they were in the midst of the fiery furnace, and we never have it in recorded that the boy said, Hey, Lord, if you don't mind, can we get out of here? Oh, no, they stayed right there. Better to be in the perfect and the center of the will of God and in the fiery furnace than to be with the king. And you notice they stayed in there until the king commanded them to come out? And the Lord said, go ahead, fellas, you're not done yet. You still got a race to run. And I want to tell you something, I'm proud of you. I bet the Lord told them, I'm proud of you guys. You did good, man. You had faith. You trusted me. You believed in me. Well done. Well done. 
God's presence is going to be with you and I in the race to the end. And Moses spake all these words unto all the Israel, and he said unto them, I am 120 years old this day. I can no more go out and come in. Also the Lord has said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. And the Lord thy God, he will go over before thee. There, take, take that phrase right there. Whatever race you're in, God is before you. Whatever circumstance that you're going through a trial, God has gone before you. And you know why? Because his presence is going to be with you when you get there. He says, And he will destroy these nations from before thee, and thou shalt possess them, and Joshua, he shall go over before thee, as the Lord hath said. Ah, oh, you see, you've you got to trust God's presence, church, in the race we're running. And I know sometimes that may be hard and difficult. But we're in the race, and we've got to run it. And God's not finished with us yet. And he, whatever he's called you to do, whatever race he's put before you, remember, the Lord says that he will finish it until the day of Jesus, Jesus Christ. God's going to perform in your life whatever he's called you to do, whatever that race is, until the day of Jesus Christ. So he's going to be with you in this thing. Uh, so you've got to trust God's presence, all right? Let's look at it. Hey, God's presence is protective. Number one, God's presence is protective. All right, in your race, you're running. There's going to be some ups and downs. There's going to be some bruises and some scrapes and, and, you know, some scrapes along the way. But God's going to be protective in our race. What did he say? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, does God mean that or not, church? Sure he does. He promised that. Exodus thirty-three fifteen, And he said unto them, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Moses had told the Lord, said, if your presence is not with us, then, then hey, don't, don't, we're not going. We don't want to go if you're not with us. If, thy present, if your presence don't go with us, then God, don't take us up here. Moses didn't want to go up there without the Lord's presence. And you know what? You and I shouldn't want to run the race without the Lord's presence. John 16, 33 is going to do that. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Now, in the world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. 1 John 5, 4 and 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. There's your faith. There's your faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So God's presence is protective in your life and my life, in our race we're running. And uh, also God's presence gives us courage. Hey, is it, whenever you have to go somewhere sometimes and you're thinking about it and you're going, oh man, I, I don't, I don't want to face these people alone. I don't want to have this confrontation alone. Uh, I don't want to have to face them alone, the boss, whatever it is. Uh, isn't it always nice when somebody goes with you? Isn't it nice when you got somebody alongside of you? You, you? you start feeling a little more braver. You have a little more courage because there's somebody there with you. You're not having to do it all alone. Well, you may think you're having to go do it all alone, but remember, God's presence is with you. Amen. If he's with the Hebrew children in the fire, he'll be with you. If he was with Moses, he was with Joshua, he was with the apostles. Do you know what? I know somebody else he was with. How many of you think Jonah was there all by himself in the belly of the whale? First of all, no human being could survive three days in the belly of a whale unless the presence of God was there. And after all, God made the whale, right? So God's presence was there. Because see, Jonah thought he was going to run from the presence of the Lord. And he figured the easiest way out was just, hey, throw me overboard and we'll end this thing right quick. I'd rather die than go preach a revival meeting at Nineveh. I want all those Ninevites to die and go to hell. That's what the prophet was thinking. So I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm going to sail the opposite direction. Get on a boat and go. I'll solve this problem. And then the storm rose up, and all the sailors were wondering what's going on, throwing all the tackle over and everything else, and what to do. And old Jonah says, hey, the problem is me. 
I'm a backslidden prophet and I've run from the Lord. So just throw me overboard and everything will be fine. And your lives and the ship will all be spared. And it will be all be over. And amen. And I won't have to go to Nineveh and preach to the heathens. And God says, no problem, big boy. You want to make your own choice? Go right ahead. But I still have a race for you to run. I've got something for you to do, uh, uh, Jonah, and I'm going to finish it and continue it and perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so he spent three days in there in that seaweed and acid and all that stuff. He came out bleached white like Miss Sharon Terre. <laughs> and a journey that would have taken him when he got puked up on the beach would have taken about three days' journey for a human to walk it. He made it in half a day. Pretty fast, huh? If he, I, don't know how the, I don't know if the whale puked him out of his mouth and burped him out, poof, or he shot him out the hole. Poof. First human being out of a cannon. Amen? Whatever it was, when he hit the beach, he hit the beach of running. He didn't even stop running. He ran right through Main Street, downtown Nineveh, went right out and, 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 pre, and hollered out eight words on the way, and out the door he went. And revival broke out, and all of Nineveh got saved. And he sat up on the mountainside to watch what God was going to do and got mad. It's amazing, folks. Don't get mad to race God has you to run. It's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be a bed of roses. There are going to be trials and testings and circumstances and difficulties. But hey, trust God's promise. Okay? Trust His presence. His presence is protective and He'll promise to give you courage. Look at the quote here from, from Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He says, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the uh, assessment that something else is more important than fear. That's one of our presidents. Romans 8, 31, 32. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Joshua chapter 5, we come to verses 13 and 14. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, there stood a man. I love this story here, boy. This is fantastic. There stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine seeing this guy standing there, and, uh, you know, and <laughs> pulls out that sword out of his sheath and standing there holding that thing in his right hand, ready to go to fight the combat, challenge Joshua? I love it. So Joshua went unto him. Well, Joshua wasn't backing down at least, amen, and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversary? In other words, Joshua was saying, Are you for us or are you against us? If he'd have said against us, Joshua would have took off head on right in and taken him on. And he said, Nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. Who was that? Yes, exactly right. Scripture tells us that Jesus is the captain of the host of heaven. Okay? He's the captain of the Lord's army. And he says, and notice we have the capital Lord, am I now come? And, and now how do we know that was the Lord? Because we don't fall down and worship angels. Hello? We find that twice in Revelation. John was told, get up, boy, get up. Don't you worship me. I'm just another servant like you sent from the Lord to give you a message. You do not worship me. You worship the Lord God and him only. And Joshua, now and interesting, when he said he was the host of the Lord, Joshua didn't argue with him or anything. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, what saith my Lord, Yahweh, unto his servant? Joshua knew who it was. So God's presence gives courage. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that you and I may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You ought to memorize that one because you might need that this year. You might need that verse for just here. Here we have a quote from, I don't know who it's from, unknown. The will of God will never leave you where the grace of God cannot keep you. You don't have to worry about that, amen? So we see trust God's presence because it's protective and he gives us courage. And lastly this morning, and thirdly here, next week we'll have a new one for you. 
Let's see if we can work our way through this one. The third thing we've got to do, trust God's precepts. Trust God's precepts. We're looking at verses 7 and 8 in our text here. All right, so let's take a look at the beginning of your notes. You have the text. Here, here we go. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all of the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. God's precepts is law. Turn not from it to the right hand nor to the left. Now why, why should we obey God's law and trust it? What's the next phrase say, church? That thou mayest what? Prosper whithersoever thou goest. You want to prosper? You want prosperity preaching? Here it is right here. Obey the word of God. Trust God's word and obey God's word. Don't turn from it from the left to the right side, whatever, and guess what? You will prosper whithersoever you go. Then he said, this book of the law, God's precepts, the law, shall not depart uh, there uh, out of my mouth, there, thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, now you know you got to meditate on God's word, His principles, His precepts. For then shall thou, for then shall shalt make thy way what, prosperous, and then thou shalt have what, good success. So you want to be prosperous and have good success? Then you gotta you gotta you gotta trust God's precepts. You gotta trust His word. Trust and and, and you need to be obedient. Again, here it says. It's going to take courage for you and I to stand for our faith in the days we live. In the hour and the time, church, in which we're living in, and especially this year in 2024, as we approach even more and more closer to the elections, if there is going to be an election. Okay? May not be one. You understand that, don't you? Okay. See, if you can't win one way, you can win another way. You see? If you can't cheat the elections and steal the election and all of that stuff, all you got to do is the current administration declare a war, and as long as we're at war, there's no election. They're contemplating that right now. And so that's how they can win another way. So there's all kinds. And so that's why you're going to have to stand for your faith in the days in which we live. See, courage is not the absence of fear. But ignoring one's fear to do what is needed and what is right. So then he says, so you can make your way prosperous and then you'll have good success. So we need to trust God's precepts, you see. Courage comes from the word with obedience. When we hear the word in God's precepts and we apply obedience to it, then that increases our courage and we get it. See, uh, there when we talk about trust God's precepts, we, not, uh, we must not compromise. We must not be compromised. Don't compromise things in your life, in your race. And this is what's happening today. The average believer today in the world is compromising because the world has become so much part of the church and into the church and the culture. Rather than the church having an influence on the culture and the world, it's the other way around now. The world and the culture now is having an influence on the church and dictating how the church is to go and, and operate. And many today, unfortunately, of all denominations, pastors and churches are giving in to the culture. And they're compromising the word of God and their beliefs and the, word, and the teachings of God's word. And that's where we're in, you see. And for those that are not, it's going to take courage to take a stand in the days that we're living and as times move forward. And so you don't want to compromise. Jesus established the model for Christian leaders. It is not found in methodology. It's not found in methods, church, mythology. Rather, it is in absolute obedience to the Father's will. You've got to be obedient to the Father's will. 2 Timothy 2, 15 and 16, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly or handling the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more un godliness you're going to have to study folks you're going to study the word you're going to have to trust God's precepts we cannot compromise and that's what's happening today and churches all over are, are falling to it to compromise and see what's going on so must not be compromised we cannot compromise God's word Amen. period Amen. Then, then what do we do they must be observed 
We must observe the word of God and his precepts, not compromise them. Verse 8, we must observe it. Leadership begins with who we are, not what we do. Amen. Begins with who and what we are, not what we do. And, and sometimes, though, it is true. What you do defines who you are. And so we need to do this. So we talk about observing the purpose of meditation. He told Joshua, you need to meditate on the word of God day and night. The purpose of meditation, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Listen to what our first president of our United States said way back. George Washington, while we are zealously performing the duties of good citizens and soldiers, we certainly ought not to be inactive to the higher duties of religion, to the distinguished character of patriot. It should be our highest glory to add the more distinguished character of Christian. Purpose of meditation. Then there's the process of meditation. Spiritual leadership flows out of a person's vibrant, intimate relationship with God. You're going to have to have a relationship with God, folks. And you say, well, I'm not a leader. Yes, you are. Every one of us in here is a leader. You may be leading your wife. You may be leading your family. You may be leading your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, uh, as a boss, your job. Whatever, you are in a leadership position and people look up to you and look at your life and my life and they want to see how we're leading and what direction we're going in. And they're going to be, you know, we become their mentors and we need to be mentoring them in the right direction and so forth. And remember, you know, what we did, our children usually do more and greater than what we did. And the grandkids even greater than that. And so that's why it's very careful on what we do as leaders in our home, leaders in our church. George Mueller, great Christian man, fantastic Christian. The most important thing I had to do was to read the Word of God and to, and to meditate on it. Thus my heart might be confronted, encouraged, comforted, encouraged, warned, reproved, and instructed. George Mueller. Colossians 3.16, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. How many of you remember John Jay? Come on, folks, we're going back to the, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights and everything in the Constitution. John Jay, the Bible is the best of all books, for it is the Word of God and teaches us the way to be happy in this world and in the next. Chief Justice John Jay. Remember him? Okay. Very good. So in our conclusion of our looking at uh, here this morning, as we finish up on what our first part of courage, Psalms 27, 1 through 3. Ah, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Through all, though all and host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war should arise against me, in this will I be confident. That was David writing. Know what all David went through in running his race, amen. When we study a lot of these characters in the Bible, I sit there and say, whew. Man, God, I don't, I'm glad I didn't have that race. Amen. Well, and sometimes I wonder how in the world he did it. I was talking with a pastor this week, and we were talking about the sizes of churches and the growth of churches and so forth. And we were talking about the average and so forth and so on and looking at some things. And I said, you know, sometimes we all wonder, as pastors, you know, we'd like to pastor a big church, a large church, and many, multiple people, so forth. And, and I said, yeah, I said, but maybe that's not God's race uh, for me. Obviously, it's not. And I said, you know, I'm thankful and grateful for the race I have. I'm just glad that at this point in my life that this is a race God's called me to run and the race is set before me. And so be content in whatever state you're in and what you have, amen? amen. And uh, believe me, there's a lot of headache and a lot of stress and tension that come 
with the bigger ones. We were talking, I was talking with somebody in the office, I think it was our office out here, and I was sharing, I said, this is amazing, you stop and think. I said, look at all the great ones. And I mentioned four or five, what I considered fantastic pastors. And, and great works, David, in, in mega churches, I mean, huge ministries. I said, do you notice every one of them died before they were 73? I said, in that case, I'm glad I don't have a big church because I'm 74. That means my number's up because of the stress of the ministry. And you know what they all died of? Heart attacks. Heart failure. Big men, big ministries. One that I, two of them I was under. Served under. Saved under. Gone by the time they were 73. Right in the middle of their massive work. And I go, oh my. Well, you have to trust God believes that their race was over. And they had done and accomplished all that God had for them. And said, okay, it's time to come home. Of course, kind of not the way I want to go home, you know what I mean? I want to go home in the rapture. Amen. Huh. Amen. But uh, it may not happen. So I said, well, I was telling the Lord so privately, I said, now, hey, if that's the case, I'll stay right where I'm at. You know, because they all made it to 73. At least I made it to 74. So I got one up on them. <laughs> so praise God. Amen. Bless their hearts. And the only good thing about it is they got the glory before I did. Amen. Oh, yeah. Father, thank you for today. We love you. We praise you. Lord, we're going to need courage this year. We're going to need lots of it to run the race and uh, to stay true to the Word of God, stay true to our faith, to stay in our faith, stay active in our faith, to apply our faith, to trust you and your promises, trust your precepts, Lord, to pr trust your presence uh, in our lives as we run our race. I pray as we went through this this morning that the Spirit of God will impress upon all of our hearts some truth that we looked at today that we can grab a hold of and apply it to our lives. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord.